Lone wolf serial killers like Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and John Wayne Gacy live in infamy. It's a familiar archetype in true crime media. But a family of serial killers is much less common, and the killing spree committed by the Benders in 19th century Kansas is likely the most famous murder case in American history that you've never heard of. This family became known as the Bloody Benders. A mother, father, and their daughter and son, and their exploits were called the Little Slaughterhouse on the Prairie. Today's guest is Susan Janusis, author of the book Hell's Half Acre, The Untold Story of the Benders, a serial killer family on the American frontier. She discusses the dangers and lawlessness of the American West and chronicles families of the victims, the hapless detectives who lost the trail, and the fugitives that helped the murderers escape. In 1873, the people of Labette County, Kansas, made a grisly discovery. Buried by a trailside cabin beneath an orchard of young apple trees were the remains of countless bodies. Below the cabin itself was a cellar stained with blood, and the benders were nowhere to be found. This discovery set the local community and national newspapers into a frenzy that continued for decades, sparking an epic manhunt for the benders. The idea that a family of seemingly respectable homesteaders, one among the thousands relocating farther west in search of land and opportunity at the Civil War, were capable of operating a human slaughter pen, which appalled and fascinated the nation. But who the benders really were, why they committed these crimes and went on such a vicious killing spree, and whether justice ever caught up to them is a mystery that is still unsolved today. Susan draws on extensive original archival material, letters, expense records, newspaper articles, and a visit to Kansas to track the facts as far as they can get us. She describes in our discussion how one of the most important discoveries she made was a series of statements written by Samuel Merrick, an outlaw who had traveled with the Benders in the years after they fled from Kansas. These statements contain specific names and locations, which he was able to cross-reference with other sources, such as district court records and census data, to finally confirm the identities of the criminals who were working with the Benders. So in this episode, we get into the turbulent heart of 19th century America, a place where populations were violently displaced on the frontier, where folklore quickly became fact, and an entire family of criminals could slip through a community's fingers and reappear in some of the most unexpected places. So this is where true crime meets history, and I hope you enjoy this discussion with Susan Janusis. Susan, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you for having me. Well, this is quite a story, and I figure we should just get into it. But first of all, I'm curious, where did you first hear about the Benders? This seems like their name should be common knowledge, but prior to coming across your book, I hadn't heard about them. So where did you first hear about them? So I actually first read about them in a book I bought in a thrift shop when I was in my late teens, which is a collection of infamous crimes that shocked the world. And there were lots of infamous crimes in there, but that story was the one that really stuck out to me. I'd never read anything like that before. Everybody involved was so fascinating. The location plays such a big role in the crimes and it just stuck with me over the years until I felt like I had to find out a bit more about it. Right. I mean, there's a lot to say about the their crimes and their exploits and everything. First to set the stage, what do we know about the benders before their crimes? Who were they? Were what was their, I suppose, lawful like like before their crimes were discovered? So we don't know much about what the benders were up to before they arrived in Kansas. There's also some debate about whether or not they were even a biological family. I personally believe that the older couple, Ma and Pa, were probably common law married and that of the younger couple, Kate was almost certainly related to Ma, but that Kate and John Gebhardt, who they were passing off as siblings, I think they were probably actually married and it was just more convenient to pass themselves off as siblings. When they were in Kansas, they were known within the local community for practicing spiritualism, especially Kate, who would go around and offer her services and try to encourage people to allow her to speak to their dead relatives or perform kind of magnetic healing. Gebhardt was also quite a big part of the community and attended Sunday school quite frequently. But the older couple definitely just kept to themselves Neither one of them really spoke much English and the community didn't particularly get on with them in the way that it enjoyed its relationship with the younger benders. We'll have to jump around to the timeline a little bit to piece together the story. So I'll make sure to circle back to the period in question that you researched. But what can you describe the discovery that 
the people of Labette County made in 1873 that really kicks off this story? So in May of 1873, a local farmhand was passing by the Bender cabin and noticed there was a like a upset, a noise that an animal was making a noise in distress. And he, it, the property also appeared to be abandoned. And when he investigated, he just really didn't like the circumstances that the property had been left in. And the community was in the middle of looking for Dr. William York, who had gone missing about two months before, and five more men and a little girl had gone missing kind of prior to that. So initially, I think the community thought that the benders had also been gotten by whoever was committing these crimes. But then over the next couple of days, it obviously turned out that they had been the ones committing the crimes and they pulled eight people out of the apple orchard and one man out of the well and were able to identify these men as the ones who had gone missing sort of over the last three years. And the benders had obviously gone and they'd been gone for a month. So the manhunt that was launched to go after them was already at a considerable disadvantage. Right. And then the immediate aftermath, what does this manhunt look like, especially in the 1870s when you don't have an FBI, you don't have a mass media, you imagine an Old West scenario of pictures of people put up in saloons, who knows how accurate that is. So can you describe the immediate aftermath of this, the manhunt, detectives who are trying to catch the trail and everything else in the aftermath? Yeah, so one of the things that hampered the search even further was that they needed funding, but it wasn't immediately clear where the funding was going to come from. And Alexander York, who was the brother of one of the victims, got in contact with an old friend of his and asked if he would run the search. And Peckham was not a... He didn't have any experience really in detective work, but he worked with a private detective called Thomas Beers who the family had hired initially to find William. And these two men were essentially the the first wave of people who tried to go after the Benders. And they traveled down through Indian Territory. They traveled into Missouri. They traveled eventually into Texas and the Panhandle. And you, over the years, you see kind of ragtag groups of people trying to go after the Benders. But ultimately there just wasn't the level of manpower or the willingness to do it. I mean, the terrain was too dangerous. There are a lot of wars going on between white settlers and indigenous people. And I think the Kansas state authorities just felt like they couldn't warrant spending vast sums to bring this family to justice. But you're right in that obviously when there's no forensic evidence, when there's no FBI, one of the major issues they had is that the Texas Rangers wouldn't agree to help. Um, and that basically meant they couldn't go after the benders in Texas, even though they knew where they were. And so it was a lot of people kind of sitting on their hands in a more populous part of Texas, hoping that someone would come along and give them some money to go further in. Before you did the research from your book, based on what you read about the benders, does the trail seemingly go cold at this point and they become a legend like the Zodiac Killer? So I traced the Benders movements up until about 1879, um, which was a lot longer than previous kind of iterations, which sort of stopped in 1873. Or what there was a lot of wild speculation that the Benders had actually been killed by the York family or by another vigilance committee or by other horse thieves, but they do, it's after 1879, they do essentially just disappear. We know the movements of at least two of their kind of accomplices who were in Colorado, Arizona, sort of moving around, but did eventually settle in mining districts in Colorado. So if they stayed with him, which is perfectly plausible because they obviously had had a criminal working relationship, then I imagine they just continued to live as petty criminals, kind of separate from the more stable parts of society. Um, It makes sense to me that when you commit a crime like that, it's in your best interest to exist in more transient spaces. And obviously the West had a lot of those. 
And part of the reason that their interest in the case endures to today is that they just were never caught. So there are so many options for what might have happened to them for you to fill in. Right. And this is uh, what you do with uh, your forensic work is very interesting, where you're able to piece together some of their movements. Do you describe Samuel Merrick, who was an important source of information and also traveled with them? So what did he say about them? And why was he traveling with them? Because you would think if you committed such a heinous crime, you would be a persona non grata, even among other criminals, because there'd be so much heat on you. So could you describe who he is and what he said about them and why he was working with them? So Samuel Merrick, who had the exciting alias Limber Jim, was a man who'd grown up in New York and then moved out west and essentially split his time between being a cowboy and being a cattle thief and a horse thief. And he was caught in Indian Territory with stolen horses that belonged to a Native American leader. And he eventually was sent to the Detroit House of Correction to serve time for stealing them. Um, He also shot at the man trying to arrest him, which obviously increases his charge. But while he was at the Detroit House of Correction, he wrote a big series of statements detailing the time that he'd spent with the Benders in a level of detail that I had never expected to find in the case. He gives very precise directions. He gives names of people to talk to about the whereabouts of the Benders. He had met them because he shared a cabin with one of their accomplices and another person who lived in the cabin was also a relative of the Benders. And so he, I get the impression from his writing that initially perhaps he wasn't really aware of the crimes. He also seems like a man who sort of stayed out of other people's business. The way he writes about Kate suggests that maybe not, I mean, he might have had romantic feelings towards her or he just, you know, didn't necessarily view her as the criminal part in that party. Um, But it is interesting that he spent such a long amount of time with them because at some point he must have found out that um, they'd obviously not only killed 11 people, but that one of them was an 18 month old child. And I, I wonder if in that jail cell in Detroit, he started to think about what that really meant. And he offers repeatedly to go after the Benders himself to lead uh, military support to the benders. He offers to drug them so they're easier to take. And I think his association with them and his kind of indirect role in keeping the authorities away from them was something that he obviously struggled with um, the further away he got from the situation. He was uh, the source that unlocked a lot of other sources that could give you other information. With his statements have specific names and locations, you can cross reference these with other sources, such as district court records, census data. What were you able to uncover about the benders in this time period once he led you to all these other sources? Well, his statements allowed me to plot exactly where the benders had been camped. So I could kind of mark where, you know, like they just missed being caught by the detectives, because along with Merrick's statement, I then had letters from Thomas Beers saying, oh, we just missed the benders. They were camped on Mud Creek that were written at the time. So in sort of summer of 1873. And then Samuel Merrick's statement, which was written a bit later, would say they were camped on Mud Mud Creek. They moved further west to the Little Wichita because they had heard from the sheriff, who was corrupt, that detectives were had been tipped off to their location. One of the major breakthroughs for me was being able to link the Benders with the McPherson brothers, who were actually the offspring of a very well thought of wealthy family from Kansas. But unlike their siblings, who I think went into the oil industry, Frank and Bill decided that they'd rather live on the open frontier. They both had illegal liquor rackets. They both stole horses. Missouri Bill seems a bit more like a career criminal than Frank who was a volatile psychopath who enjoyed just beating people to death at the drop of a hat. And that for me was really important because at the time there was the assumption that the benders were attached to a larger group of horse thieves. 
um, a Missouri bill had a whole network of people who were working for him, including Samuel Merritt. And this basically enabled me to be like, yes, they did have a network. This was the network. This is also part of the reason why they were able to escape so easily and get so far out because they had all this assistance from these very well-connected criminals. And that was just a real breakthrough moment for me to read about Missouri Bill in Merrick's statement and then find a prison record for William McPherson that had in pencil scrawled underneath Missouri Bill. That was a real like, aha, there are other people involved in this moment. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. I'd like to jump around in the timeline and focus in on two different periods. The time when they're committing all these, you know, heinous murders and then afterwards when the family is on the lam. So during their time in Kansas before they flee in 1873, can you describe, and I know the information is scattered, but what did they do? Who were their victims? And do we have a sense of why they committed so many murders? So when they were in Kansas, they were, like everybody else, attempting to set up a successful farming operation. They had livestock, they planted food, they obviously had the orchard, um, and they gave off the kind of impression of being just like all the other homesteaders. Um, I think that Kate especially struggled with this. She seems like a very ambitious woman. She was always in town giving lectures on spiritualism. She told people she wanted to be famous. She was very much not afraid to push herself into situations where she wanted to be acknowledged. I think that, I mean, John was moving backwards and forwards, probably with stolen horses, ever since they moved into Kansas. I think they definitely had a pre-existing criminal background, even if they had moved to Kansas to start over. And they targeted their primary victims were men who were traveling alone. Um, This is probably because Kate acted as a good lure to the cabin. She was an attractive young woman. She was very chatty and charismatic. And they'd basically invite a guest in, I imagine sort of suss out whether or not they were worth murdering. And then while they ate dinner, they'd be attacked from behind and then dumped into the cellar. And there's a very clear modus operandi on all the victims. They have exactly the same wounds. They're buried in the same way. And this allowed people to link the vendors to other crimes that had been committed in the area. There'd been a couple of bodies found on the prairie, which had exactly the same wounds, which had previously just been written off as the work of local outlaws. So they were, the vendors were sort of functioning as members of the community whilst picking off people who were coming through who are a bit more transient. Um, and obviously what really got them into trouble was when they killed George and Mary Ann Lonker because their neighbor, William York, would be the one whose disappearance would eventually prompt the massive investigation into what was going on. Did you get a sense of why they killed their victims? Were they just simply trying to steal their assets or something else? I think it's probably a mixture. Again, it's very difficult to know because we can't see or hear from anyone who was in the situation. I think it was probably a mixture of wanting the horses, wanting the goods. Lots of these men had money on them because they were going to the land office. Um, They also had things like one of them had a luxury chinchilla coat. And I think the goal definitely was material, but I also have no doubt that somebody in that family, I think probably John Gebhardt, did have a proclivity for violence and enjoyed enacting it. And I think he probably saw the location of the cabin, the amount of people who stopped and the type of people who stopped as an opportunity for him to enact those tendencies while also sort of gathering stolen goods. In this next time period when they're on the run, really, they are fugitives at perhaps the best time in history to be a fugitive with the frontier. You can change your identity very easily, leaving from one town to another. There's very little the authorities that can can do to capture you. Justice as it exists is frontier justice or even vigilante justice. So if you know how to keep your head down, you can really avoid scrutiny. If you're part of a group as they are, then they're strength in numbers. So they have 
that type of collective protection that could make it very difficult to arouse enough people to try to bring you a justice if they even know who you are. So what did these next several years for them on the run look like? Where they appear? What could you gather that they were doing during this time period? And how did they scratch out a living? So they essentially spent 18, the summer of 1873 to, well, up, we know, till at least sort of 1877 on the open frontier. They were, they moved through Indian territory where the focus was really just to get them away from the authorities. And then they head west into the panhandle, um, kind of towards the state plains. And they're right in the area that the Red River War is going on. And Samuel Merrick describes how they're trading with tribes. They're keeping, you know, away from the military. There's a real mixture of people involved in this group. They're hiding out in canyons and they're essentially eking out a living by doing what they had been doing in Kansas. They're stealing horses. They're trading. The men did a lot of buffalo hunting. Samuel Merrick talks about how they'd leave the camp. They leave the women in the camp for an extended period of time and then return. And then obviously they'd be able to sell the buffalo skins and the meat. Um, I think the person who probably struggled the most was Kate. Samuel Merrick describes her as being fed up that they're worth so much money, but they're living in such what she considers to be appalling conditions. Um, I imagine every so often they drifted into a town but they had a, a bit of a close call with a detective in 1874, which was part of the reason they were so keen to go further onto the plains. Um, so they weren't making any kind of real living. They were just living hand to mouth day to day, essentially doing what they could to avoid being caught. Hey everyone, Scott here. One more brief word from our sponsors. Eventually, what do we know what happens to them? What sort of end they come to? Well, the the big frustrating thing is that we don't know. You can make all sorts of educated guesses. I mean, it could be that they stayed on the planes long enough that they felt they could return to society without being noticed, which is perfectly plausible. I tend to think that they would not have been able to not be in some form of criminal activity. They just seem like such kind of seasoned criminals that I assume that they would have been involved in crime somewhere else, even if those weren't murder. Um, but it's also totally possible that they were killed by people on the frontier who didn't even know they were the benders. And I think that's why people still are so interested in the case, because there is just no closure. There's no answer as to where they went. There's no real clue. And that's led to lots of people saying, oh, well, they must have been lynched before they left Kansas by a vigilance committee. But the research that I did showed that obviously that wasn't the case. They did make it out. But that's not to say they weren't got by someone further down the line who never said anything about it. Once they disappear and we don't hear anything about them or no, there are no reasonable traces of them, do the Benders become part of folklore or did their, does their legend live on in Kansas or the frontiers or elsewhere? So it's been really interesting talking to people today because people have either heard of the Benders and are very aware of them or they can't believe that they haven't heard of the Benders. When we were in Kansas, certainly I'd say 80% of people we spoke to, kind of both in Topeka, Lawrence, and then obviously the areas where the crimes took place, they were all very aware of the benders. Lots of them offered family connections to people who were involved with excavating them. Some of them offered theories about what happened to them. Um, when we were looking for the site of the land, we pulled up and asked a man on the side of the road and he knew immediately what we were talking about. So they're still very much a part of the folklore in Kansas. And I think, you know, they even um, Red Dead Redemption 2 had characters based on the benders. So they're definitely there in American culture. I think they're just a couple of levels below the big frontier figures that we're familiar with, like Billy the Kid and Jesse James. <laughs> 
So lastly, what do you think their murders say about this time period in American history? I mean, this is a time of violence, displacement of populations, where society isn't really filled out. I mean, it, it's very porous. So it, it's a very interesting time. But just based on all the things that you researched, what did you come away with your impressions of this time period and what the benders say about it? I think the benders are very unique, actually, in the way that violence was a part of life on the frontier. Because as I was reading about it, there were all sorts of things that went on. I mean, you had external threats to settlers. You obviously had disputes over land between settlers and Native Americans. But and even within communities on the prairie, people would attack each other over land disputes. You know, people would get into bar fights. There obviously was a kind of remnants of the behavior that had defined bleeding Kansas uh, with the guerrilla warfare. There were lots of young men who'd come out of the war and then were a bit listless and didn't really know what to do. But all the violence, that type of violence was very sporadic and explainable and sort of makes sense within the context of what's going on. These are people living a hard, difficult life and who are often trying to build lives for their families. And then in the middle of that, you've got this very specific, consistent type of violence, which is so frighteningly methodical in the way that it's enacted. And I think it's so different from all the other kind of violence that you read about on the frontier that it really makes you realize how they were able to get away with it for so long, because it didn't even occur to people that that was going on. It wasn't something that they could even fathom would have happened in these communities who, even though they got into disputes, would try and look out for each other. And I think the fact that it went undetected for so long sort of belays the attitude towards violence at the time. And also uh, an attitude towards life. I mean, people just went missing on the frontier. That was just what happened. If your husband went out to run an errand, he maybe wouldn't come back. And I think we obviously don't necessarily have that attitude anymore. But that kind of casual violence was such a part of life that that's why they went undetected for so long. Well, you have taken a true crime story, but also placed it in, as you described, one of the most violent chapters in American history of reconstruction on the frontier. So your book marries a lot of these topics. And for listeners who want to check this out in much more detail, the name of it is Hell's Half Acre, The Untold Story of the Benders, A Serial Killer Family on the American Frontier. Susan, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. That's all for today's episode. If you'd like to see show notes with sources, maps, links, anything else related to this episode, and all my other ones as well, go to ParthenonPodcast.com. That's the name of the podcast network this show is a part of, along with James Early's Key Battles of American History, Steve Guerra's Beyond the Big Screen and History of the Papacy, and other great history shows as well. If you'd like to support this show, the two easiest ways to do so are to subscribe to it on the podcast player of your choice and leave a review. The second thing is to join the membership program for History Unplugged. If you do so, you'll get completely ad-free episodes for the entire back catalog, which is about 600 episodes and growing, 